We are going live in five, four, three, two, one. We are live. Good morning, friends. Welcome to Brain Teasers, season two, episode eight. This is the signature tune of our Brain Teasers. Point. Good morning, friends, and wish you all a very healthy and a spirited new year to come. Welcome back to Brain Teasers, episode eight of season two. Let me introduce you all again to the concept of Brain Teasers. Brain Teaser is an edutainment initiative which was introduced last year by Sarakshi Netrale. This year, it has become a live online quiz which is conducted once a month on a web-based platform on first Sunday of the month. Also, it's no longer just a quiz, but much more. To increase your learning and knowledge, we have added new sections like pearls of the month, wisdom from the heroes in ophthalmology, and to break the mundane, we have sections like ophthalmic humors, shairies from our own ophthalmic presence. Season two began in the month of June, and till date, we have conducted seven monthly quizzes. Brain Teasers also had the privilege to conduct quiz along with national societies like Delhi Ophthalmological Society, that is DOS, and Ocular so Trauma Society of India. All these quizzes must have added to your knowledge, I'm sure. So friends, how was the last year? Answer is obvious for one and all. Yes, it was not so good. So now it's time to celebrate new year and wish. It gives us a year full of fun, warmth and health. But friends, do you know the significance of New Year and why is it celebrated? New Year is observed on 1st of January, the first day of the year on the modern Gre Gregorian calendar, as well as it was celebrated in pre-Christian Julian calendar, pre-Christ era. In Julian calendar, the day was dedicated to, to Janus, the god of gateways and beginnings, for whom January is also named as. Now coming to the lens. Lens is the most important structure in the eye and probably the most important tissue in the whole body going under the scalpel of a surgeon. Still in our country, cataract has been responsible for 50 to 80% of bilaterally blind and it affects till date even now 9 million people with cataracts. The COVID has put an break to the ambitious project of Vision 2020 that is right to sight, all in doldrums. So let us pledge in this new year to fight for this cause with renewed energy and vigor. And so is the exactly the reason why we decided to have Lens as the theme for the first quiz of this year, new year 2021 for brain teasers. So aptly christened by our co-host as lens o -meter. Today we have three special guests as our invitee. Padma Shri, Dr. Jivan Titiyal, he is a professor and head, cornea and cataract and refractive center at RP Center, Delhi. Welcome, sir. Another Delhi man, an innovator, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, called as Terminator. Not because he is lethally attacking like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but because he gave the world the technique of terminal chop. Welcome, sir. Our third guest is no other than Dr. Harsha Bhattacharji. He is a director of Sri Sankara Deva Nitrale, an unassuming man of few words. Welcome you all, sir. Today, I have two young Turks as my co-host. Dr. Divakant, a prolific vitreoretinal surgeon and a young dynamic leader of Yossi from Lucknow. And Dr. Bibhuti Kashyap, a proud alumni of RP Center and another young vitreoretinal surgeon from Ranchi. Welcome you, Diva, as well as Dr. Bibhuti. You will be my co-host for today. Yes, friends, we are available on Facebook and YouTube, where one, 
you where you can retrieve previous as well as this program today sharing the mantle with me is my co-host dr shilpi requesting now dr shilpi to familiarize the participant with the rules of the game over to you shilpi yeah thank you sir so good morning friends wishing you all a corona free new year for the ones who have joined us for the first time here are the rules for the today's quiz who can participate any ophthalmologist from a novice in ophthalmology that is a post graduate to the most seasoned practitioner remember quiz has five sections with five questions in each section every question will have four options only one amongst the four is correct so you have to first select the correct answer and also click the save button to record your answer if you are not sure of the correct response don't be in a hurry to press the co correct response as once you click the save button you cannot change your answer this is what the participants will see on their screen this is a sample question for your understanding identify the character character shown in the picture below option a tom option b jerry option c donan option d none of the above this timer will start for 20 seconds and you have to record your response only after the timer starts now here the answer is b so first you have to click this b button and then also press this save button so that your answer will be recorded so who wins the prize naturally the one who answers correct and importantly answers first that is the fastest finger first so what are the prizes we have one section winner so it means in total we have five section winners and that's not all for every session of 25 questions we have two mega prizes one for the runner up and one for the winner that means in total we have five section winners one runner up and one winner so what is for the tie breaker if there is a tie for a section the cumulative performance of all the five sections will be considered but if there is a tie for the session winner that is the runner up and winner dice will decide your fate but remember you can be section winner only for the one section but don't give up as you can win the session prize with your consistent performance in case of any discrepancy judges decision will be the binding so what are the prizes prize money of rupees 1500 for every section winner runner up will get the prize money of rupees 5000 and the winner will carries away the prize money of rupees 7000 it's not only the gifts winners you will be invited for the concluding ceremony where you will share the screen and interact with the our today's guests who are the who's who in ophthalmology so winners be alert you will be sent a zoom link as well as you will get a call on your registered mobile number you need to join the platform as soon you get the confirmation now i invite dr divakant mishra sir who has got the training in advanced retina surgeries from bias i institute stanford university san francisco and shri shankara deva netralya guwahati he is the recipient of various international ophthalmic awards like achievement award by asia pacific academy of ophthalmology ophthalmic hero of india star of india award 2020 the apvrs award by asia pacific vitreo retina society indian journal of ophthalmology the best of best award he has 30 publications and book chapters to his credit he is reviewer of plos one igo and icc igceo he is the invited faculty at various international conferences like ao apao u retina and acrs 
So over to Deva Kansa for the further proceedings. Thank you so much, Dr. Shilpi, for such a kind introduction. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Prashant, sir, and his whole team of brain teasers for this wonderful concept. And at UOC, we have conducted online quizzes, and we know how difficult it is to get this done. And I'm very impressed by the smooth uh, functioning of this uh, platform. So let's start the quiz. And this is the first section. Let's warm up. I hope all of you are ready. You are all well aware about the uh, all the rules that Dr. Shilpi has told us. Let's move on to the section one with the question number one. So question one is how old is the first documented case of cataract throughout history? Your options are option A, option A 2400 BC, option B 1400 BC, option C 400 BC, and option D 40 BC and your 20 seconds start now. So the main thing to focus here is the first documented case of cat time. A small hint is that it is from the Egyptian history. So your time is about to end. Okay, let's move on to the answer. The answer is option A, that is 2400 BC. So the image that is shown here, if you look at it, uh, the left eye, we can see a white reflex, a leukocoria. So it is thought that this sculpture, uh, which dates back to 2400 BC, is the first documented case of cataract from Egypt. And there are a lot of instruments related to eye surgery also found during the excavation. So that establishes and it is, uh, is the first case of cataract in documented history. So let's move on to our second question now. So are you all ready? Let's go to the second question. So name the French ophthalmologist who performed the first modern cataract ex extraction on April 10, 8, 1747. Let's see the options. Option A, Jack Daviel. Option B, John Taylor. Option C, Albert von Greffe. And option D, John Lewis Bosch Jr. And your 20 seconds starts now. A hint would be here that he was a French ophthalmologist. So he was the first person who performed the modern cataract extraction, and we are not talking about couching here. So your time is about to end. Let's see the answer. So the answer is Jacques Daviel. So of course he was a French ophthalmologist and he is credited to perform the first modern uh, cataract extraction. And we are not talking about couching here. And he used a variety of instruments like the corneal knife, forceps, scissors, a blunted needle, spatula and a spoon. He made an inferior incision and the cataract was gently pushed with the help of his fingers out of the anterior chamber and onto the cheeks. And then the eyes were bathed in a mixture of water and wine. And then uh, a cotton dressing was done and the patient was required to lay on their back in a darkened room for approximately eight days. It sounds a lot like modern day retina surgery. So let's move on to the question third. Who performed the first documented intracapsular cataract extraction in 1753? The options are Jacqueline Barraqua, option B, Samuel Sharp, Option, option C, Bradford Shingleton, and option D, Luther Fry. And the time starts now. So this is about the intracapsular extraction now, uh, and it happened in 1753. So time is about to end, just three seconds more. Okay, let's look at the answer. The answer is Samuel Sharp. So in 1753, Dr. Samuel Sharp was credited to perform the first documented case of ICC. And of course the entire lens and the lens capsule is removed through a large limbal incision here. And Samuel Sharp also used his thumb to expel the cataract from the eye. Uh, for learning purpose, there are other methods of ICC like the Smith's method, the Arugas method, the RIC fakes where a suction probe was used 
then cryosurgery where cryo is used and of course the chemical dissolution of zonutes as well let's move on to our next question so can opener capsulotomy was developed and popularized by option a dr little and dr sinski option b dr newen and dr gimbel option c dr kimia shizumu and dr kelvin t furko and your time starts now all these doctors are associated with capsulotomy in one way or the other that's why it makes it a little confusing last 5 seconds remaining okay so the time is up let's look at the answer the answer is dr dr little and dr sinski uh, so we we know dr sinski's name from the sinski's hook and both of them uh, popularized and developed the uh, can opener capsulotomy which was the standard of care for a long time but all of us know the disadvantages uh, the the capsule tends to tear in such cases so then in early 1980s dr furco began using the tearing method which is the principle behind the calvinina rexus uh, but uh, he is like a forgotten hero and dr thomas newen uh, described this technique in, in more detail and which was further popularized in america by dr gimbel so these three techniques at least all residents should remember the can opener the envelope technique where a linear incision is made in the capsule and the ccc let's go on to the last question who co-founded the intraocular implant club in 1966 along with dr harold ridley which was responsible for the gradual acceptance of artificial lens implantation uh, this person also developed several models of ions let's look at the option option a peter choice uh, dr richard kratz option b option c is dr albert gallen and option d dr thomas newen and your time starts now we all know dr harold ridley well but this other person should also be learned now 5 seconds are remaining let's look at the answer the answer is dr peter choice that is option a so uh, peter choice was a student of dr harold ridley and they together uh, founded the international intraocular implant club in 1966 and why we are talking about them is because this club was responsible for the acceptance of artificial lens implantation and later on peter choice developed various iol models and his choice mark 9 which was manufactured by rainer intraocular lenses became the first us fda approved iol in 1981 so dr harold ridley has been a pioneer and he is the person who is credited with uh, the first iol implantation and the interesting story behind that is that one of his residents stimulated him uh, for this idea and during one of the lectures he talked about why can't we place an artificial lens inside the eye and then he was treating a lot of fighter pilots and they had come with uh, pmma uh, sharpness inside their eyes and he found that uh, these materials were inert and well accepted by the fighter pilots and later on he used pmma as the material so this is the end of section 1 and uh, now the section 2 will be uh, taken care by dr bibhuti kashyap and let me introduce him he is a very exceptional and bright young ophthalmologist and surgeon he is the deputy director of kashyap memorial eye hospital rachi and his area of speciality is vitreo retina uva rop cataract and refractive surgery he has trained from the best of the best he is uh, his post graduation and senior residency from rp center aims and he followed it up with an oncology and medical retinal fellowship from italy and he's done a lot of surgeries and is a very exceptional person over to you dr kashyap Thank you so much, Dr. Devakan, uh, for such a kind introduction. Now, uh, it was a, a very informative section one for me as well. Now, I hope the viewers and the participants are all warmed up uh, for section two. So, without wasting further time, uh, we'll start off with the first uh, question of section two. Am I audible clearly? Yes. Yes, Bibhuti. 
So the first question of section two is, the lens nuclei is retained in all of the following except, the options are A, chromosome 13 anomaly, B, rubella, C, Peters anomaly, or D, Lovis syndrome. And your time starts now. Time's up. And the correct answer for this question is Peter's anomaly. So Peter's anomaly is a disease among constellation of diseases causing congenital coronal obesity due to anterior segment dysgenesis by means of faulty migration or separation of neural crest cells. As we all know, there are three waves of neural crest migration that the first wave forms the endothelium, the second wave forms the stroma and the third wave forms the iris. So any problem in the migration of sep or separation of these causes these kind of anterior segment dysgenesis. So type 1 is the one that affects the iris, coronal endothelium and the decimates membrane. And the type 2 has additional lens abnormalities. The lens may be abnormal, but the lens nuclei is not retained in these anomalies. The second question, all of the following are features of persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous or PHPV, except A, it is unilateral, B, it is hereditary, C, it is associated with microphthalmos, and D, it is one of the common histopathological findings in enucleated eyes of suspected retinoblastoma. And your time starts now. Time's up. And the correct answer is hereditary, option B. So persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous or persistent fetal vasculature is a rare congenital developmental anomaly where there is failure of embryological primary vitreous and hyaloid vasculature to regress. Has three forms, purely anterior, purely posterior in the form of falciform retinal septum or a combination of both. It is mostly unilateral and non-hereditary and is associated with microphthalmos. And along with Coates disease, it is one of the most commonly missed diagnoses in eyes enucleated for a wrongly diagnosed retinoblastoma. It's worthwhile to know that uh, mistakenly done enucleation rates are, are as high as 1.5% and these are the diagnoses that you find in such mistakenly enucleated eyes. So coming to the third question, Microspherophakia is associated with all except. Options are A, small stature, B, Alport syndrome, C, rubella, and D, hyperlysinemia. And your time starts now. up and the correct answer is hyperlysinemia. So microspherophakia is basically as the name suggests uh, a lens which is a very small diameter. It is usually bilateral condition and there is increased anterior posterior diameter. The equator of the lens is visible with full mitriasis and there is movement of the lens with change in posture. The, others, uh, the other abnormalities associated with this microspherophakia is lens dislocation or subluxation, high myopia, defective accommodation, and glaucoma. This is a list of various associations of microspherophakia, and hyperlysinemia fears pretty much very lower down the list and has been reported only in one or two case reports. Uh, coming to the fourth question. A type of cataract seen in Hallermann's tree Francois syndrome is A. Sutural cataract, B. Membranous cataract, C. Anterior polar cataract, or D. Pyramidal cataract. And your time starts now.
time's up. And the correct answer is B, membranous cataract. So Hallermann's sheep francois syndrome is a rare sporadic anomaly, uh, which results in frontal prominence, small beak nose, baldness, progeria, micronathia, pointed chin, hypodontia, short stature, and a narrow upper respiratory airway. And the type of cataract associated with this syndrome is membranous white cataract. So coming to the last question of the section, all are true for anterior lenticonus except A, it is associated with Wardenberg syndrome. B, it is associated with spina bifida. C, it is usually bilateral. And D, it is usually congenital. And your time starts now. So we need to answer which is not true for anterior lenticonus. Time's up. And the correct answer is D, it is usually congenital. So anterior lenticonus, as the name suggests, is the uh, localized anterior conical bulging of the anterior lens capsule as compared to a posterior lenticonus, wherein, by, as the name suggests, there is posterior bulging of the posterior lens capsule focally. So anterior lenticonus is usually bilateral and acquired, not congenital. It is associated with Alport syndrome, spina bifida, and Wardenberg syndrome. Posterior lenticonus, on the other hand, is may be associated with Lewis syndrome, and there are various clinical signs like fishtail sign and at all sign described intraoperatively and preoperatively for diagnosing uh, posterior lenticonus. Anterior lenticonus may pose a surgical challenge in, in successful completion of continuous curvilinear capsular excess due to the central cone. And in such cases, maneuvers like starting rexus from mid periphery and incorporating the cone or doing a lens matter aspiration before the rexus has been described. To tackle a posterior lenticonus surgically, same maneuvers approximately as that for posterior polar cataract are employed. So with that, uh, we come to the end of section two. And meanwhile, as the backhand team uh, starts computing the result for section two, uh, we go in for a break, uh, the intersectional break. And in the meantime, I would take this opportunity to introduce the first guest of today's session. Professor Jeevan S. Titial. Uh, he is the professor and head of cornea, cataract, and refractive surgery services at RP Center Ames, New Delhi, and is also the chairman of National Eye Bank. It is an honor to introduce and speak about such a stalwart of Indian ophthalmology, more so on a personal level as he was my guide for my PG thesis. He is someone who every resident in RPC tries to emulate in their cataract surgeries, whether it be his machine settings or his technique. As they say, if you have the perfect role model, your job is half done and Professor Titeal fits that bill just perfectly. He has over 290 publications in peer reviewed journals. He has been involved in multiple international instru instruction courses. He was the first Indian to perform live surgery at ASCRS USA. He has multiple international and national honors to his name, including the coveted Padma Shri by the President of India in 2014. He is the past president of Delhi Ophthalmic Society in 013 to 014 and is currently the president of ISCKRS since 016. And now it's time for his Pearl of the Month. I'm going to stop the screen sharing from my side. The management of posterior polar cataracts. Sai, so go back to the video.
साई एनी प्रॉब्लेम सुटले हो पाएगा आप इनकॉर्पोरेटेड है साई शाल आई डू इट फ्रॉम माय एंड या प्लीज डॉक्टर या वन मिनिट शेयर स्क्रीन करना पहले सेक्शन थ्री का नाम लेकर आते हैं Is it is it visible? Yes, doctor. It's loading. The management of postoperative cataracts is surgically challenging, owing to the high incidence of posterior cataract incidence. Pre-operatively, postoperative cataract may be classified on straight line examination into four types. In addition, तेरे से पूरा फ्लेवर आ गया प्रशांत यू कैन आस्क डॉक्टर टिटियाल टू शेयर हिज स्क्रीन या आई थिंक सो टिटियाल सर हेलो डॉक्टर टिटियाल सर हेलो Shall I try sharing the screen? Yeah, please do. Titiyal sir, are you there? I'm there. Do you have presentation on your laptop, sir? I'll have to download myself. You know, it's in my. Okay, we'll email. try. Meanwhile, meanwhile, we'll try, sir. I'm sorry for the. Um, my I'm net is not. also little today, not doing well. Okay, Let okay. Me. We are trying, sir. Meanwhile, I will try through the other laptop. Shall we? Management of postoperative cataracts is surgically challenging owing to the high incidence of posterior cataract incidence. Pre-operatively, 
post polar cataract may be classified on state lab examination into four types. In addition, anterior segment OCT may help to delineate the size and shape of post polar opacity. Intactness of PC and detect pre existing PC defect. Conventionally, hydro dissection is avoided in post polar cataract. Multiple hydro delineation rings are created. And a layer by layer or a slow motion fake emulsification is performed. Avoidance of hydro dissection leads to a difficulty during cortical cleanup, and any stress on the fragile posterior capsule can lead to a PC defect during irrigation aspiration. Intraoperative OCT or IOCT provides a real-time dynamic insight into the intraoperative manipulations. Three morphological variants of postapolar cataract were observed in IOCT. Type 1, postapolar cataract were characterized by an intact posterior capsule clearly visualized along the entirety of posterior polar opacity and a clear homogeneous space between the posterior capsule and the hyperreflective postapolar opacity. Type 2 postapolar cataract was characterized by an intact posterior capsule observed in the periphery of the opacity. Posterior capsule could not be clearly delineated in the entire posterior polar opacity with the dense central region of opacity apparently adherent to the posterior capsule. Type 3 posterior polar cataract was characterized by dense posterior polar opacity with extensive shadowing and an inability to delineate the posterior capsule status in the entirety of the Capacity. In type 1 posterior cataract, after capsular excess, hydro delineation was performed using a blunt 27 gauss cannula. The separation between nucleus and epinucleus with formation of an epinuclear cushion was visible as a hyporeflective region on IOC. After hydro delineation, a gentle hydro dissection was also performed in type 1 posterior polar cataract. The passage of fluid wave resulting in a separation of posterior capsule and cortex was observed in IOCT, and the integrity of posterior capsule was assessed. The epinuclear cushion was maintained throughout the nuclear emulsification in all cases, and an intact PC was visualized at all steps of surgery. The cortical matter was gently peeled off from the posterior capsule starting from the periphery towards the center. A foldable intraocular lens was implanted in the back. No case with type 1 posterior polar cataract developed an intraoperative posterior capsular defect. In type 2 and type 3 posterior polar opacity, only hydro delineation was performed in all cases and hydro dissection was avoided. The cleavage plane created by hydro delineation waves were visualized in IOCT. The intactness of epinuclear cushion was assessed during nuclear emulsification. Three eyes developed posterior capsular dissections during the stage of aspiration of epinuclear cushion. One eye with type 2 posterior polar cataract and two eyes with type 3 posterior polar cataract. IOCT helps in risk stratification of posterior polar cataracts based on the morphological features. Operatively, anterior segment OCT may be used for morphological characterization of posterior polar cataracts. Interoperatively, IOCT aids in decision making regarding whether or not to perform hydro dissection. We demonstrated safety of performing hydro dissection in cases with type 1 opacity. Uh, Dibuti, over to you now. So, uh, thank you so much uh, for such a technologically innovative video, sir. Uh, if I may request you to co please come live with us. 
So yeah, it was a it was a uh, brilliant study and uh, a new classification system, intraoperative and preoperative. Sir, um, I have a few questions on behalf of the general ophthalmology audience and uh, the postgraduate residents who are very early on in their career. So at centers, sir, which don't enjoy the privilege of an intraoperative OCT, do we have some clinical signs on slit lamp maybe to predict a pre-existing posterior capsular discontinuity, which may alarm us for a possibility of an intraoperative PCR? Yeah, first of all, uh, Bhibhuti, uh, uh, thanks for our invitation and uh, welcome all the people who joined uh, today in your uh, brain teaser session. And uh, my best wishes for uh, this year, 2021. As uh, we going into a cataract session, I think posterior polar cataracts, as you rightly pointed out, does uh, give a challenge in the you know, intraoperatively to maintain the posterior capsular integrity. Therefore, it is one of the most important case in cataract group where you require a very good pre-op examination. And that too, you know, with the full examination under dilatation. And if you do look into straight time examination, that can delineate most of the cases. And you could see in a more objective way in an anti-segment OCT also. But straight time, you have to see few things. One is the size of opacity. Because larger the size, you have more chances of adherence to the posterior capsule. So size is very, very important. Anything more than 3, 3.5 millimeter has a higher risk of posterior capsule adhesions. Second is the density of opacity also. That is the reduplication which have, happens towards the anteriorly from the posterior uh, part of the, you know, this uh, opaque disc. So that is also important. Third is the grade of a nucleus hardness. If you have a softer cataract, that means patient has come to you early. So adherence towards the posterior capsule may be less likely in these cases. So you have a hardness, harder than nucleus, you have more chance of posterior capsule adhesions happening. The other important thing is if you could visualize the posterior capsule beyond the posterior capsule, that is the anterior vitreous phase. So sometimes you can pick up a telltale uh, signs, which may be a little bit of granulation happening just behind the lens capsule which may point towards a, a deficient posterior capsule in these cases. Or a, in a congenital cases, you can have a fish tail sign. So what we are talking about, these are adult uh, uh, type of posterior polar cataract. They are totally different than a uh, congenital posterior polar cataract. Mm -hmm. That uh, I think PGs have to understand. And both require a different type of assessment and management. As far as the finding which I told you in our street lamp can be reduplicated or a more objective way by anti-segment OCT, which we see in IOCT also. And you can know the status of a posterior capsule very, very clearly in these cases. And beyond the posterior capsule also you can see very nicely and then plan your surgical technique or a surgical manipulations or a FACO parameters accordingly. Yes, sir. Uh, there was also a sign described by Dr. Daljeet Singh where he said that um, if there are uh, mini satellite cataract opac cataractous opacities around the central disc of a posterior polar cataract, that denotes usually a deficient capsule because there is, because any hypothesized that there is entry of aqueous through the deficient capsule causing uh, multiple opacities around that. So, what is the utility of that sign in your experience, sir? As far as I'm concerned, you know, all uh, uh, features of uh, anything beyond the disc may point to us, you know, some sort of uh, uh, changes happening in the posterior part of the lens uh, uh, nucleus cortical complex in relation to posterior capsule. Yes. And these peripheral changes normally doesn't affect the posterior capsule at all. It is a central disc, which is the major part, which may have a relationship towards a posterior capsule. Either it is attached to the posterior capsule or it, there may be a deficiency of posterior capsule. So one of our articles is just going to come in JCRS where we, we have hypothesized the entire process of this disc formation. Whenever you have a posterior capsule disc coming up, we start from the posterior poles towards the uh, center of the nucleus. The peripheral cortical fibers, they get, you know, uh, di uh, disaligned from the disc. That's why if you saw my one of, one of the videos has a classical central disc defect. So that explains it is the central area, which is important, not the peripheral area. Yes. And once you have this disc def defect seen, that means your PC is intact. Only the disc has come out during your nucleus emulsification. So Absolutely. that explains the concept of a posterior polar cataract formation 
and the safety of posterior uh, capsule also. So peripheral opacities, though it will increase the size, but normally they don't have attachment. It's the central area which has the attachment. So very at least sir. And so one more question that the postgraduates usually ask us who are novice to, I mean, who are, who are pretty new to the FACO ML certification and you know, beginning to operate the, these, these sort of complicated cases. So can you guide them as to what should be the size of capsular excess in the posterior polar cataract? Should it be slightly smaller than normal to ensure a good sulcus so that in case of uh, a PCR, you have a good sulcus for multi-piece or should it be larger than normal to prevent the fluid trapping and sudden increase in the back pressure? Uh, to you know, cause a PC defect. So, uh, what do you, according to you, what should be the size? I think uh, Bibhuti, a uh, very very nice question because a lot of uh, whenever we talk about cataract surgery, many people have a different thoughts and different ways to handle a uh, same type of cases. And as far as caps capsular excess is concerned, it has to be ideal size. That means it should not be too big to uh, not to allow lens uh, edge to be covered by these capsular excess margin, which is the concept of in the bag implantation. Or should not be too small to have a difficulty in your nucleotomy also. The ideal size in a posterior, uh, any cataract surgery would be around 4.5 to 5.2 millimeters. Here also, I would recommend to have a normal size capsule axis. Don't make it too small or don't make it too big. Because the lens optic size is 6 millimeter, which is the lens we are putting. And most often you'll be putting in the sulcus. So that is a 12.5 millimeter, 13 millimeter overall diameter. It will retain you know, whatever size capsule actually you have made. So don't worry about the, uh, the concept of uh, not having a support. It is the having a better uh, surgical aspect of uh, a complicated cast. There has been a concept of doing a, a oval capsule access also, especially from uh, Dr. Kiranji Singh from Amritsar. Mm -hmm. uh, I normally there also, the oval size also, the largest diameter doesn't cross more than five millimeter. So that is the concept also. Don't make it too large, which is more than six millimeter, that makes the surgery more difficult also sometimes because nucleus can tilt and bulge it out sometimes. And putting the your important premium lens in these cases will be very, very unideal in such situations. The rexus should be ideal size of 4.5 to 5.2 millimeter. Thank you so much, sir. You just proved it why people try to emulate, emulate you always. Uh, I think uh, this is it from uh, uh, this section. Sir uh, Prashant, sir, can we go to uh, announcing the section winners? Yeah, I think it is in your chat. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, Dr. Devakan, sir, uh, for the section one, please do the honors. Thank you so much, Dr. Bibhuti. Uh, thank you so much, Titiyal, sir, for such a wonderful presentation and all the question and answers. So the section one winner is Dr. Sohini Mandal from New Delhi. Congratulations. And... <laughs> And you will be receiving a link on a mobile. Please join in and keep playing for the rest of the se sections to be the se segment winner today. Yeah, Dr. Bibhuti, the next. Actually, she's working in my unit only now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> she's my new SR. <laughs> uh, and the section two winner uh, for today is Dr. Ayushi Sinha from New Delhi. Congratulations, Dr. Ayushi Sinha. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, over to you, Dr. Devakant, for section three, please. Yeah. Just a second. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Bibhuti. And let's move on to section three. We are two very exciting uh, segments. Now to section three, the first question. Okay, let's move to basics. True about the adult lens, your options are, A, shows a greater curvature of the anterior surface than the posterior surface. B, shows an average thickness anterior to posterior of four mm. C is held in place by zonular fibers arising from the posterior iris and D has an equatorial diameter of about 10.5 mn and the time starts now. Please read all the options really carefully. Five seconds to go. 
and your time is up. So let's look at the answer. The correct answer is option A. It should, has a greater curvature of anterior surface than the posterior surface. Let's see why. There are a lot of uh, data. Let's look it through a diagram. So this is, I got it from the EOFTA website. It's a very good uh, schematic representation. Uh, so the anterior surface is less, less convex, thus has a greater radius of curvature of approximately 10 mm. And the posterior is more convex and hence a lesser radius of curvature of around 6 mm. Now the thickness uh, of the or the anterior posterior diameter is approximately 3.5 mm at birth, but it keeps on increasing uh, by 0 0.02 mm each year throughout life. And the equatorial diameter or the lens diameter is 6.5 mm at birth, and it increases to 9 mm in the second decade, and then it remains more or less constant throughout life. Okay, now let's move on to sec uh, our question two. Now, true about the change occurring in an aging lens. Your options are option A, the oldest lens fibers are externalized. Option B, absorption of wave, ultraviolet wavelength increases. Option C, a yellow pigment is deposited in the posterior cortex. And option D, posterior migration of the lens epithelium causes nuclear changes and your time starts now. It's really important to know about the aging lens. Five more seconds to go. And your time is up. Let's look at the answer. The correct answer is B, absorption of ultraviolet wavelength increases. Now let's, uh, the lens epithelia turns inwards at the equator and elongate and constantly forms new lens fibers and thus internal, internalizes older lens fibers rather than externalizing them. Then the yellowish pigment is deposited in the nucleus and not in the posterior cortex and can keep on absorbing ultraviolet light. Then posterior migration of length epithelium causes posterior subcapsular cataracts and not nuclear changes. So I think that's sorted. Let's move on to the question number three. True about the capsule of normal adult lens. And your options are A, it is the thickest basement membrane in the body. B, produced continuously for only approximately first 35 years of life. C, it is thickest at posterior pole of the lens. And D, includes major structural proteins like type 2 collagen, laminin, heparin, etc. And time starts now. So you have to tell what's true amongst these four options. Read all the options really carefully before going for the answer. Just five seconds more and your time is up. Let's look at the answer. The correct answer is A, it is the thickest basement membrane in the body. So lens capsule, which is a transparent membrane that surrounds the entire lens is thickest basement membrane in the body. And it is the thinnest at the posterior pole and it's produced continuously throughout life. And type four collagen is one of the main and in the options it was mentioned as type two. So let's move on to the fourth question. It's about the lens epithelial changes can cause cataracts by your options are A, metaplastic changes resulting in anterior subcapsular cataract, B, migration posteriorly re resulting in equatorial subcapsular cataract, C, production of toxins causing nuclear sclerosis, and D, anterior migration causing posterior cortical cataracts. And your time starts now. Halfway through. Last five seconds remaining. And your time is up. Let's look at the answer. The correct answer is A, that is metaplastic changes resulting in anterior subcapsular cataract. Let's look at the explanation. Now, the anterior subcapsular cataract is usually anterior trauma, blunt injury, or anterior uveitis, which leads to metaplastic changes. Now, in case of posterior subcapsular cataract, there is posterior migration of the lens epithelium, 
And in nuclear cataracts, there is compaction of lens fibers and deposition of the pigment, and it is not from toxins. And the last option that is anterior subcapsular cataract, that is anterior migration of the lens epithelium. So let's move on through the last question. Which of the following is not an in vivo cataract classification system? Your options are A, lens opacity classification system, option B, the Oxford system, option C, WHO simplified cataract grading system, and option D, lens grading system, and your time starts now. So which one is not a cataract classification system? Last five seconds remaining. Okay, and let's look at the correct answer. The correct answer is D, lens grading system. There is no such system at present. And see, this is what the LOCS plate looks like. So there are various uh, systems that have been developed for better uh, grading of cataracts and which are mainly used for research purposes, like the LOS, various types of the LOS systems. And the other system that we should know about is the Wilmer system, the Oxford system, the WHO one, and the Japanese system as well. So that is uh, the end of this round. And uh, I'll move on to, uh, let's, we have another guest with us today. Uh, we'll be declaring the winners after this talk. And I have the proud privilege of introducing Dr. Harsha Bhattacharji. Uh, he has been my mentor and like me for various, many ophthalmologists from Northeast India and from around India, he has trained them. So he's the president and trustee of Sri Shankadev Netrale Gohati. And uh, this was organization was declared as center of excellence in 2004 by Dr. Manmohan Singh who was the then prime minister. And Dr. Bhattacharji has uh, various awards and presentations and publications to his credit. And he's an examiner uh, at various universities, including the Royal College of Surgeons. And he has been a pioneer in the Northeast. He was the person who uh, brought in intraocular lenses, modern cataract sur surgeries. He introduced phacom emulsification, and he also introduced uh, vitroretina setup to the Northeast. Uh, so, so, sir, may we have you live with us? Yes. So, thank you, sir. So uh, uh, I'll be playing your slides and yeah. So uh, just before sir starts, so sir had some issues with his laptop, so he won't be able to present his videos, but he has been very gracious in uh, coming here and will be speaking through these slides. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dibakan. And thanks to the organizers and those who are participating a bit louder closer to the system so you can turn on your video as well sir and those who are participating in the today's meeting it is a very interesting meeting i think all the participants will be immensely benefited benefited now what i will be going to tell you it is nothing new a particular complication has occurred previously, decade onwards, now also, and it will continue in the future. Next slide. The posterior capsular rupture, you won't click it. Next slide. Is a major intraoperative complication, and the literature say it can occur in one to four percent of cases, even in expert heads nowadays. Proper management, if it can be done, it results in a desired visual outcome, and otherwise the result can be disastrous. Next, it doesn't warrant panicking, but requires a planned approach. Next slide. Every FECO surgeon needs adequate training for this proper management. So, PCR can occur during many stages of cataract surgery. One common situation is the capsular axis, particularly if it is a intraventricular intra pressure is high, it can extend. During the time of hydro dissection, if the capsular axis is smaller, 
over hydration or if there is a ppc as already dr tc has told if the properly case is not assessed with the surgery maybe during the lens nuclear fragmentation and this at the and the when even the fragmentation has been performed then the cortical aspiration is done at that time also the uh, pcr has been seen next slide so another point to remember this particular complication can occur with or without vitreous prolapse vitreous prolapse means the vitreous can come into the anterior chamber our today's discussion at the time is very much limited pcr during the lens fragmentation what happens actually when pcr is possible when the last fragments are removed when the pc is unprotected and there is the attempt to remove incompletely separated lens fragments and we are need to know the punch hole sign identification of the punch hole sign to prepare to take proper protection before the disaster occurs i should not say disaster no matter the complication occurs and sometimes the pcr has occurred early but it is detected during the lens fragmentation next slide now first of all we have to know how to prevent the pcr we have to know how to do a proper hydro dissection next slide what will be the proper capsular excess size as it is already been mentioned and when mechanically we divide the lens by the chop technique or any other technique at the time if the proper methodology is not followed the pcr can occur now sometimes the peco probe is not kept in the same zone they go they are very close to the posterior capsule so even it can cause the ultrasound itself can cause a pc rupture now the peco machine to be set with proper dynamics with the proper titration of ultrasound fluidics and loc grading has to be done what type of strategy will take up now what are the possible presentation of pcr when the pcr occurs during the lens fragmentation it may be a small or large pcr small pcr means if it is located in the central part about 2 3 mm area and if it is beyond than this we can cause a large pcr and as i said the nuclear fragment may remain or may not remain or very little amount of nuclear fragment remain and these fragments may be small and large all these points are to be considered and we have to ascertain vitreous prolapse is there in the anterior chamber or no vitreous prolapse in the anterior chamber next slide thirdly fourthly the fluid may diverse inside the vitreous cavity the pressure inside the vitreous cavity can increase so the direction of the fluid should be towards the angle of the anterior chamber after the pcr has occurred otherwise the fluid may go inside the vitreous cavity and cause expulsion of further vitreous and the lens fragment may drop inside the vitreous cavity so this is a possible presentation may we encounter the steps when pcr is recognized when we recognize the pcr has occurred our objective is to prevent the collapse of the anterior chamber and the prevention of enlargement of the lens and maintaining the shape of the globe in its physiological condition as we have seen n number of times if the pc is convex then many it is very tough very thought we can polish the capsule we can do the capsule there is many thing we can do but if it is concave bulge forward it is the weak because of the physiological uh, property of the posterior capsule normally it is deviating behind until unless there is some congenital defect in the development of the posterior capsule 
the postural capsule is very tough and if the chamber is maintained properly and the proper methodology for phacoemulsive medication is followed, then the chance of PCR is reduced. So our objective is to prevent the collapse, to prevent the enlargement and maintaining the globe in shape. Stop the phacoemulsification as well as the aspiration, only maintain the irrigation. Then with a side port, fill the entire chamber with dispersive viscoelastic substance and remove the handpiece carefully. So these are the essential steps a surgeon have to do. A person surgeon have to do when the PCR has been recognized. So one, two, three step we should remember. There is no question of panicky because I have already seen the PCR occurs in the expert hand, in the resident hand. But if the methodology of management, standard protocol is there, if it is followed, the PCR is nothing to be worried. You will give the, the predictable, predictable visual outcome, even the patient will not be knowing something wrong has happened. Then proceed further, be sure the surgeon knows it or not, whether he's trained on management of the PCR or not. If not, then don't try. Take help of the others who knows it. I believe this is the most important step, step considering the safety of the patient because a person who knows the technique, he will give a very unpredictable result. Then if the vitreous is prolapsed, identify and the vitreous has to be managed very, very meticulously. Next slide. The management of residual nuclear fragment. When there is no vitreous in the anterior chamber, in the viscofield eye, anterior chamber manipulate the lens fragment away from the rent. Emulsify the lens fragment. Use copious viscoelastic to both protect the corneal endothelium and viscodispersive viscoelastic we can use here and tamponading the posterior capsular rent, you can use cohesive viscoelastic material. You, you multiply the lens fragment, be careful that you are taking proper protection to the endothelium and PC, and all your settings should be low, low. The ultrasound should be moderately high as per the nuclear grade and fluidics, the bottle height, everything should be low so that very gently the nuclear fragment can be removed. Now, if the piece is larger, the wound can be enlarged and with a wire vitis, it can be removed safely. Now, the second situation is there. If the vitreous is prolapsed in the entry chamber, then what we should do? Now, use irrigation plus vitrector into separate port. If the vitreous is prolapsed, there is no alternative to switch over to vitrectomy system. And there are certain methods have been described. The irrigation and vitrectomy, two limbal incision you make, or you enlarge the side ports, we have already what we've already made. In one port, you give the irrigation. I've already said the irrigation should be directed to the angle of the entry chamber, not to the posterior, posterior capsule. And vitrector you use to do the future further man manipulation. Now, remove the vitreous with the vitreous cutter. A surgeon should know what will be the optimal setting of the cutter, what will be the cut rate, what will be the aspiration rate, and smaller gauge the vitrector. From my experience, I have seen if we can switch to 27 gauge, the procedure become easy because the fluid turbulence and the fluidics are not disturbing too much in the anterior chamber. And it is very safely the procedure can be done. If not available, then they can 25 gauge or they can use 23 gauge. But 20 gauge gives not very good successful result because they, the vitreous fraction is more, the pulsatile vitreous fraction is more, and the post operative period, some retinal complication, there is a high possibility that may occur. Now, I've already told the temporary PCR with cohesive OVD and ultrasonic fragmentation of residual nucleus, the specification, I have already given the outline. Next slide. 
and bimanual, uh, if the nucleus is not there, only the cortical remnant is there, then you do a bimanual aspiration and the vitrectomy cutter is the best option. You can aspirate and if you think the vitreous is captured, you put the cutter for some time. So aspirate and cut, aspirate and cut, you are in a completely safe condition. Next slide. Next slide. Now, we do anterior vitrectomy for managing such a situation. Now, what is the goal of the anterior vitrectomy? We remove the vitreous from the anterior chamber because vitreous is not the normal abode of the uh, as the anterior chamber is normal, not the normal abode of the vitreous. Now, if the vitreous is here into the anterior chamber, it can destroy the corneal epithelium, it can cause iris atrophy, it can cause repeated inflammation to the eye, it can cause even cystoid macular edema, it can give rise to retinal detachment if it is incarcerated to the wound. And we, we should always clear the vitreous from the anterior and allow the intraocular lens to be placed so that we cannot leave the patient a fake ink. Now, what are the principles of removing the anterior vitrectomy? Now, I want to say one point, the vitreous has an attachment into the vitreous base. We have to clearly understand the retinal periphery is 100 times thinner than the central retina. And the collagen fibrils is elasticity and its tangile strength, it is sufficient to cause a retinal tear. Some tear may be undiagnosed, and after a few months, so when the vitreous tamponade will go, the patient will come with the retinal detachment. So we cannot endanger the patient's life. We can make the procedure unsafe. So the proper methodology we have to, we have to follow. So remove the vitreous, Promise non way, what I want to mean, what I mean to mean, the vitreous is in the vitreous cavity. So, if you want to remove the vitreous, put the cutter underneath the posterior capsule, if you approach anteriorly, and if you think that personal approach, you know it, or your colleague will come to personal approach, so that will be a formal personal approach. That point will come soon. But remember, we cannot mask anything. I have seen, I have witnessed one surgery, the lens nucleus dropped and it was sinking. The surgeon is used to an wire vectis and he has scooped out the retina. This horrible experience, I tell all my students, so never, never do all this thing, never. Now, FACO probe, should not be there in the vitreous cavity. Next. Next. Wire vector is never in the vitreous cavity. The fluid levitation by Charles Carl's, um, Kelvin, that is also a dangerous thing. It also gave retinal tear. I have seen many cases. Next. And cellulose caused vitrectomy is another dangerous, uh, dangerous thing. All the situation, what happens? The, the vitreous is attached to the vitreous base. We pull it. And the vitreous base is out of our sight and out of our mind and we cause a retinal tear and then patient come with a retinal detachment. I think all who are doing VR surgery, they are getting plenty of such cases. So this four maneuver, very dangerous. Never to put a wire vectis in the vitreous cavity, never to put a, a FACO probe because many videos are there, but it is a very dangerous. One time we may be successful, but all the time, the antisocial situation will not be successful. It's a very dangerous procedure. Sponge vitrectomy, cellulose sponge vitrectomy is another problematic situation. So like this, and fluid levitation, these four things for the historical interest or the development of the management of the uh, drop nucleus, we can, we can remember, but we should not follow this in our routine day to life. Regarding the method, as I have told you, if the surgeon is trained with limbal incision, then he, he take a vitrectomy, vitrectomy cutter. One side will put the infusion, another side will cut, cut it, and the vitreous is to be removed. 
first to the anterior chamber, then gently put the vitrector just behind the posterior capsule. And as it is a collagen fiber, linking is there, so it will slowly, slowly pull all the vitreous. Even if you highlight it with some, um, some uh, the, the prime syllable, you'll see from the wood which is coming. Never sweep the vitreous. Never sweep the vitreous. First, you cut his link, then you can clean the wood. What I mean to say, some surgeons I have seen put a flat instrument and try to release the vitreous from the wood. Mind that one side it is attached to the wound, other side it is attached to the vitreous base. So we are pulling both the sides. And that is the pulsatile vitreous traction. The pulsatile vitreous traction means we become desperate. At one point of time, it gives a very big pull and it is sufficient to cause a small tear. And along with subsequent vitreous change, the patient will be able to touch it. So what to be done? You cut it into the iris surface. It's completely separated. Then you can remove with the wound, but sweeping should not be the primary procedure to release vitreous from the wound. Now, in single port parsonal vitrectomy, it is my choice. What we do, one port is there in the anterior chamber, the irrigation port, which is already the primary surgeon is put while doing cataract surgery when complication is occurred. The second port we make just four millimeter behind the limbus in the parcel region for 4.5 millimeter. We visualize the tip into the pupillary area. We take care that it is not touching the it is not touching the posterior capsule. Inject little amount of triamcinolone acetoloid. This will highlight the vitreous. And from behind the uh, behind the posterior capsule, from the anterior vitreous way, the entire vitreous can be vitreous safely removed. We have done this procedure repeatedly many times, but the every time the result is uh, predictable. But what I want to say again, if the people is larger, they started cutting from the peripheral part. If the people is small, then there is no option out. We can cut the center. So if you forcefully introduce the cutter, that may also cause uh, some problem into the vitreous base. So single port parsonal vitrectomy is a very good option. I think it should not be in the scope of the VR surgeon. This procedure, all the cataract surgeon must get some training, must get some training. And at the time, if they have proper vitrectomy machine, they can manage it, Other, otherwise the case can be set. I have never seen a lens fragment causing damage to the eye. If the cortex and vitreous mix is there, or a lens nuclear fragment retains for a longer period of time, more than two weeks, at the time there is some immunological response occurs and inflammation, inflammation may occur. So ideally, within two weeks, the case to be managed, it can be sent to a VR surgeon and patient to be informed that this complication has arrived. What we do in the preoperative counseling, we explain all the pros and cons, surgical complications. The patient, most of the patient will not be will not be taken in a different way because we'll be making sure that whatever vision uh, recovery was possible following cataract surgery, we'll give the same sort of visual recovery, but you require a second, second intervention. Next slide. Now, if the lens nuclear fragment or lens nucleus goes into the vitreous cavity, I've already said no levitation, no wire vectors, no phaco probe. Only the only one option is three port parsonal vitrectomy, and the removal of the lens nuclear fragment and the lens nucleus as per the standard and safe norms. So this much I want to highlight so regarding the management of the, uh, if the PCR occurs during cataract surgery, I'm again telling you it is never a panicky situation. We should not make our children frightened that this is something serious. It is serious definitely, but it's a manageable serious. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to take part in your uh, wonderful meeting. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.
it was quite enlightening devakant over to you thank you so much sir anvil uh, sir has answered all the questions that i had in my mind and sir had to leave early so we'll not hold him any more and thank you so much sir for such a wonderful presentation and you are such an inspiration to all of us and the words of caution that sir has given in his presentation that everybody should keep in their minds while tackling such cases thank you so much sir thank thank you very much okay so so let's it's time to announce the winner for the last segment and uh, we have our first non delhi winner so she is dr prerna from vardha maharashtra uh, congratulations dr prerna and please you'll be receiving a link on your mobile and uh, please log in to us and please keep, uh, keep playing for the next of the sessions to be the session winner now may i invite dr bibhuti to scare, share his screen and take on the next sessions yes thank you dr devakan so um, let me share my screen with you all now uh, next next segment would include both section 4 and section 5 with an intersectional break um and after that we have uh, the guest the third guest lecture and after that we'll be announcing the section winners uh, of both the sections section 4 and 5 and then um, session winners will be announced uh, to note that uh, section winners should also continue playing to because they also have a chance at uh, winning the session uh yes the section winners cannot win the section twice but session i mean they they are always eligible for to win the session prize so let's start the section 4 and the first question of section 4 is a type 3 femtosecond capsulotomy is an incomplete capsulotomy a b a capsulotomy with micro adhesions c complete capsulotomy or d complete but non continuous capsulotomy and your time starts now times up and the correct answer is incomplete capsulotomy so as we all know femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery uses photodisruptive laser of wavelength 1053 nanometers to create conal incisions arcuate keratotomy capsulotomy and nuclear division a capsulotomy in a femto surgery is a micro can opener capsulotomy while an ideal capsulotomy achieved is a type 1 or a complete capsulotomy there may be morphological variations of capsulotomy that can also be achieved amongst which type 2 is capsulotomy which which still has micro adhesions type 3 which is the incomplete capsulotomy and type 4 which is a complete capsulotomy capsulotomy but it is non continuous now coming to the second question The best IOL power calculating formula for post LASIK eyes are is A Hoffer Q, B Huygens, C Holiday one, or D Holiday two. And your time starts now. Time's up, and the correct answer is B. Huygens. So, uh, in order to choose the right IOL formula, we need to know which formula suits which eye. So, for axial lens less than 19 millimeters or very short eyes, Holiday two is the preferred IOL formula. For axial lens less than 22 but more than 19, Hoffer Q is the formula of choice. SRK uh, holiday one is for eyes between uh, axial lens twenty four point five millimeters to twenty six millimeters, and SRK T is for axial lens more than twenty six millimeters. Now Huygens is a fourth generation IL power uh, calculating formula, wherein the uh, IL power is given by the form formula D is equal to A naught plus A one AC plus A two AL. A A naught is the manufacturer's lens constant. A one is linked to anterior chamber depth AC, and the value is zero point four. And A two is linked to axial length measurements, uh, and this is a constant number. The value is zero point one. So as we all know, with uh, LASIK, um, the keratometry values are changed and 
the relation of anterior curvature and posterior curvature is altered. As a result, the normal standard keratometry readings are always flawed and tends to overcorrect or undercorrect in myopics or hypermetropics. So that is why a formula which is independent of the K readings need to be taken in high case as a perfect example of that. Coming to the third question now, it's a factual question. Uh, not much explanation needed for this. Concentration of trypan blue used for staining lens capsule is A, 0.06%, B, 0.15%, C, 0.25%, or D, 0.20%. And time starts now. Time's up. And the correct answer is 0.06%. So trypan blue can be used to stain the anterior capsule during cataract surgery as well as internal limiting membrane during ILM peeling. The concentration of trypan blue for anterior capsule staining is 0.06% and for that for internal limiting membrane is 0.15%. Now coming to the fourth question, femto delineation is employed for A, posterior subcapsular cataract, B, anterior subcapsular cataract, C, posterior polar cataract, or D, intumescent cataract. And the time starts now. Time's up. And the correct answer is posterior polar cataract, option C. Now, what is femtolineation? It basically is uh, done on a femtosecond platform, which as discussed earlier, it uses a photodestructive laser to create uh, various incisions as well as nuclear division. So in, in, the, in the femtodelineation pattern uh, on the femtosecond platform, multiple nuclear layers that act as shock absorbers during surgery is created. So these are all customizable, sharp and predictable layers of, and it provides predictable layers of uh, cushioning to protect the posterior capsule uh, until the end of lens removal. It is also useful in posterior polar cataracts with an associated dense nucleus because there is no need for a mechanical division technique that would stress the capsule zonular complex. Now, coming to the last question of section four, if C is the cylindrical power of toric IOL, which has been misaligned by X degrees, then the resultant residual astigmatism R is given by the formula. Your options are A, 2C cos X, B, 2C sin X, C, 2C tan X, or D, 2C cot X. And your time starts now. As we all know, uh, the most common nuisance of a toric IOL is misalignment or rotation. So this question is uh, a factual question regarding that post-operative complication, if you can say. So time's up. So the correct answer is R is equal to 2C sin X, option B. So this is, uh, this is the formula to calculate residual astigmatism R in a misaligned toric IOL, which is misaligned by X degrees. So most rotations usually happen within 10 days of surgery and the earliest most common cause is residual viscoelastic behind the IOL and the late causes of course includes the IOL design, the arch and the axial length. So rotation of more than 10 degrees need to be corrected because it changes the IOL power by 30 by 30%. 30 These rotations need to be corrected within one week but of course can be achieved up to one month post-operatively. The diagnosis is made on slit lamp, although the 10 degree reticules on the slit lamp limit the accuracy. The other methods of diagnosing a misalignment would be eye trace and online toric result analyzers. Now with this, we come to the end of section four and we will straight away head to section five and we'll be announcing the section winners together at the end. So the first question for section five is, True about IOL glistening is A, it occurs in hydrophilic IOLs, 
B affects contrast sensitivity at both higher and lower order spatial frequency. C affects contrast sensitivity at higher order spatial frequency. Or D affects contrast sensitivity at lower order spatial frequency. And your time starts now. Time's up. The correct answer is C. The IL glistening affects contrast sensitivity at higher order spatial frequency. Now, what are glistenings? Glistenings are basically fluid filled micro vacuoles that can appear within the IELTS optic as early as one week after surgery. And they typically grow both in size and density over time. The suspected risk factor is the temperature variations during manufacturing or storage of the IOLs or the injection molding methods of IL manufacturing. So basically it is a manufacturing defect of the IOL and is usually seen in hydrophobic IOLs. Now, affect and visual function is actually a matter of controversy. These can cause retinal stray light and, la and light scatter, which negatively affect the vision quality, especially contrast sensitivity at higher order spatial frequency. Uh, coming to second question, uh, all are true for Swan syndrome, except A, happens after a complicated cataract surgery, B, recurrent hyphema is the presenting feature, C, vascularization of wound site is the most common cause, and D, investigation of choice is gonioscopy. And your time starts now. Time's up. And the false statement about Swan syndrome is that it happens after a complicated cataract surgery. So what is Swan syndrome? Swan syndrome is a recurrent intraocular bleeding from a prior cataract wound, which was first described by Swan in 1973. It occurs months to years after uncomplicated cataract surgery involving a scleral incision. Why? Due to a wound neovascularization because of extension of episcleral vessels into cataract wound, likely due to poor wound apposition. The presentation is with intermittent vision loss because of recurrent hyphema. Precipitating factors are minor trauma or straining and or it can also be completely spontaneous. And in rare cases, the visual loss can be accompanied by painful hemolytic glaucoma or angle closure glaucoma. And in such cases, gonioscopy reveals wound neovascularization at the prior scleral incision and the first line of treatment would be gonioscopy assisted, gonioscopy lens assisted focal argon laser photocoagulation of the new vessel. Uh, it's a rare syndrome. Now, coming to the third question of the fifth section, all are true regarding negative dysphotopsia or NDP, except option A, type 3 shadow is the true NDP shadow. B, angle kappa more than 0.44 mm predisposes to NDP. C, occurs in uncomplicated cataract surgeries. Or D, horizontal width of shadow is 6 to 10 degrees. And your time starts now. Uh, this question is taken straight from the study of Dr. Jack T. Holiday. Time's up. And the correct answer is D, the horizontal width of shadow is 6 to 10 degrees. In a negative dysphotopsia, the, uh, the width of shadow is usually 0 to 6 degrees with a mean of 2.6 degrees. Now coming to the explanation of it. So what is negative dysphotopsia? It's, a, it's basically a phenomenon similar to horse blinder where we have a dark arc on the temporal side of vision. This usually happens after an uncomplicated cataract surgery. Now, Dr. Jack T. Holliday with uh, the ray tracing technology showed us that there are three types of shadows that are deciphered. The type one shadow is caused by the total internal reflection from the IOL. Type 2 shadow is from the anterior sharp IOL edge and a type 3 shadow is by posterior sharp or truncated lens deformity and this shadow is the true negative dysphotopsia. 
Now, in a nominal acrylic pseudophagic eye model with a 2.5 mm diameter pupil, the maximum retinal field angle from rays refracted by IOL is 85.7 degrees, and the minimum field angle for rays missing the optic of IOL going straight away is 88.3 degrees. So this leaves a gap, a temporal dark gap of 2.6 degrees in the temp in the extreme temporal field, which is the negative dysphotopsia. Now, angle kappa is the angle between visual axis and the pupillary center. So bigger the angle, herein we're talking in terms of chord length because it's in the terms of chord length that the angle kappa is usually given in the um, machines that are there to evaluate angle kappa. So bigger the chord length that is more than 0.44 mm for angle kappa or in other words, the more central your pupil is in the cornea away from the visual axis, the higher the chances of negative dysphotopsia. So you have a higher angle kappa, you will, you're going to end up with a negative dysphotopsia. Uh, coming to the fourth question, flap sign is used to predict A, capsular excess extension, B, posterior capsular rent, C, zonular dialysis, or D, none of the above. And your time starts now. This sign is also called as the flap motility sign. And this has been described very recently. So if you are, if you have, if you people have gone through the journals and the, and you have attended conferences, this sign has been very extensively talked about in the conferences. Time's up. And the correct answer is capsular excess extension. So this flap motility sign is given by Dr. Rohit Om Prakash very recently. And this flap motility sign is to ascertain the extent of capsular excess. Now, if the extension, if the flap of capsular excess is extended and is everted and fluttering, this indicates that the flap has not extended beyond the equator and phaco emulsification can be safely continued. But if the extension, if the extended flap becomes inverted on the nucleus and stops fluttering, this indicates that the extension has gone beyond the equator and this is the end point of any attempts of safe safe phaco emulsification and this and these cases should be converted to ECC or an SICS. Now, why do uh, the flaps which extend beyond the equator invert? Because with the extension beyond the equator, the posterior capsule gets involved. The posterior capsule may get opened up. Uh, so there is a negative suction pressure downwards, which along with the increased capsular bag volume due to the phaco probe, the irrigation, uh, I mean the phaco probe and the irrigation and uh, the, the lens volume, the anterior capsule tear is pulled down. So that is why when there is an extension beyond equator, the flap tends to get inverted. And if it is not inverted, we can still attempt a safe rexis and continue with our phaco emulsification. It's a very useful sign that has been recently described. Now, the last question of this section and the last question of this quiz is lactochrumenacea. Lactochrumenacea occurs in type 1 capsular back distension syndrome, B, type 2 capsular back distension syndrome, C, type 3 capsular back distension syndrome, or D, type 4 capsular back distension syndrome. And your time starts now. Time's up. And the correct answer is lactochrumenacea is a type 2 capsular back distension syndrome. Now, what is a capsular back distension syndrome? It is a syndrome which it is a it is a rare complication happening post-operatively or rarely intraoperatively. Now, post-operatively, there is an accumulation of fluid between the uh, implanted IOL and the posterior capsule in cases where in-bag IOL implantation has been done. So this fluid can be either clear or milky turbid along with a posterior capsule opacification. In some cases, the posterior capsule may also be clear. So this turbid fluid or a liquefied after cataract, this can cause uh, variable disturbances in the quality of vision uh, and the quantity of vision also. So there are various types to it. A type one 
um, uh, capsular back distension syndrome is where a transparent capsule is present and a transparent liquid in the capsular bag is there, which is barely noticeable via slit lamp by a microscopy, but is clearly seen on the anterior segment OCT. A type 2 is a homogeneous milky fluid in the capsular bag with a transparent posterior capsule, and that is what is called a lactocrumenacea or a milky white appearance. A type 3 is a transparent or a semi-transparent liquid with a posterior capsular opacification. And a type 4 would be opaque contents with posterior capsular opacification with or without Sommering's ring. So with that, we come to the end of section 5. And meanwhile, as the back office people uh, continue to compute the section 4 and section 5 winners, I would take the opportunity to introduce to our viewers, participants and audiences, uh, our third guest for the evening. He is Dr. Rajendra Prasad. He is a proud RPC alumni uh, from Ames, New Delhi. And he currently is the director and the senior consultant at RPI Institute Research and Training Center, New Delhi. He has uh, multiple innovations to his name, uh, including the terminal chop technique, Terminator, the wedge tool, high dissect for posterior polar cataract, a sewing needle microcapsulotomy, which he is going to be demonstrating in his video today, a T-soft for soft cataract. He has also won the National Innovator Award 2018 by National Constitution IMA on August 4th, 018 at Chennai. Has multiple goals, IRSI gold medal 017, UPSOS gold 017, UKSOS gold 2017, Ecoin gold 2015, so on and so forth. He has also won the... Come again, sir. Please continue, Dr. Bibut. Yeah. Uh, he has also won the best paper in AIOC 017, in IRSI 013, best video in IRSI 019, AIOC in 019 and Roscon in 017. He has been and has uh, numerous paper paper presentation, video demonstrations, and instruction courses at various international and national platforms like ASCRS, ESCRS, Asia Pacific CRS, APAO, AIOC, and IRSI. And over to his pearl of the month, sir. The backhand office, can you please share the slide are for you playing or shall I play for you? Huh? Sai? Shall I are you playing, Sai? Yes, sir. They're, they're playing. To be here with all of you in this beautiful morning. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Prashant Bankley for giving me an opportunity to be here in this special episode of uh, Brain Teasers, the online quiz which is an exemplary educational series, which Dr. Prashant has come out with. Uh, I think this is uh, one of the series which is most sought after by the PG students, especially those who are preparing for the exams. Now this episode is especially for the cataract surgery. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, one of the very important subjects that is Argentinian flag sign. You all know that Argentinian flag sign is a well-known complication during capsular axis and it was an early white and the mature white cataracts. We are just breaking the entire capsule, your capsule opens up and the tear extends radially to the periphery and many times this tear may wrap up around the anterior capsule and uh, extend into the posterior capsule giving us serious complications. So because of its seriousness, the several techniques have been described including the 26 gauge needle aspiration technique. But believe me, in spite of many techniques, the radial extension of the capsular tear is still continuing to be a challenge to all of us. And if you look at the literature, the incidence of the radial capsular tear extension has been put forward around 28.3% by most of the leading surgeons. But what is important is out of these 28.3%, almost 7 to 24% of the cases, the anterior capsular tear convert into posterior capsular tear and which becomes a little the very serious problem to all of us. 
So I'm going to describe a very simple and very swift and very effective technique, saving little micro capsule ottoman to avoid Argentinian flax cell. Now this is the technique which uh, is uh, going to be published in the next issue by the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. Now this is, I'm going to show this technique in this pre-recorded video. Argentinian flax sign is a well-known complication during capsular axis and intumescent white cataracts, which typically arises stantly after the initial puncture of stretched out tense anterior capsule. Till date, it was known that the raised interventricular pressure along with forward thrust of the nucleus is solely responsible for the extension of the tear to periphery. To counter this, several techniques including the small needle aspiration technique had been described to decompress the back, but peripheral extension of the tear has still been frequently seen. And this happens stantly after pricking the capsule, even before initiating the aspiration of the liquid cortex. It means there had to be some other factors responsible, which assess the raised central intracular pressure to propagate the spreading of the capsule after the initial prick. On extensive surgical evaluation, we came to know that in reality, it's not only the raised intral intracular pressure or forward thrust of the nucleus which causes the extension of the tear. It is the configuration of the initial prick made by sharp hypodermic needle on the anterior capsule, which has the potential to spontaneously extend along its open edges. Hypodermic needle or the raxis forceps while puncturing the anterior capsule create a linear cut configuration. Linear cut with discontinuous open edges on the tense and stretched out anterior capsule tends to easily open up and split into a complete capsular tear extending to periphery due to the pressure gradient triggering off a disruptive force. Henceforth, we came up with a hypothesis that if we were able to manually create an opening in the anterior capsule which had a round regular configuration like a capsulotomy in true sense instead of a linear cut, we may provide resistance against disruptive forces thus preventing Argentinian flax sign. Round hole microcapsulotomy help liquefied lens matter to egress out and decompress the back before initiating the capsular axis. To prick the capsule, we developed a novel instrument sieving needle microcapsulotome with a round pointed tip like a sieving needle system. Sieving needle microcapsulotome when punctured the anterior capsule create a round hole opening with smooth margins unlike the linear cut produced by sharp tip needles. In most of the cases, single microcapsulotomy is sufficient to decompress the back, but in some cases, multiple microcapsulotomies are required to evacuate the multiple fluid pockets in the lens. To accomplish successful microcapsulotomy, first of all, we need to stain the anterior capsule with 0.06% of trepan blue. Once the staining is complete, then the anterior chamber is injected with cohesive viscoelastic. Then through the main incision, microcapsulotome is inserted into the anterior chamber and punctures the anterior capsule at the center. The hole created by the microcapsulotome helps to egress the interlenticular fluid out from the capsular bag. This can be completed by the milking technique with the help of the visco cannula. Once the decompression of the capsular bag is complete, then the capsular axis can be initiated from the central hole and completed successfully. The simple yet highly effective novel tool sieving needle microcapsulotome was found to be highly effective and safe to decompress the bag without propagating a radial extension of tear. Yeah.
thank you so much dr rajesh prasad sir for a lovely video it's an excellent innovation uh, and it's definitely going to help evade the argentinian flag sir may i please request your esteemed presence in the live platform okay right is a fantastic innovation sir sir i have one question with this uh, you know so we have seen that despite implementation of various techniques as you have rightly mentioned in your own video that essentially work on the same principle of decompression often we often see a flag nonetheless uh, in 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 cases where not much of liquid cortex come comes out and there is a large nucleus present in then the high ilp actually is caused by the liquefied cortex that goes behind the nucleus and that tenses up the bag and that is why the maneuvers used to decompress the bag anti from anteriorly essentially fails as the perpetrator is the is the main and the perpetrator is behind the lens action the behind the nucleus so how do we tackle such cases where we suspect a high ilp you know a large nucleus and a possibility of a flag sign and intraoperatively scant fluid egress uh, you know is seen in spite of implementing a decompression strategy like maybe your can open i mean your uh, sewing sewing microcapsulotomy or others that you have described that usually you know um, eventually also have some failures so how do we tackle such cases see the first of all this uh, technique is a very simple technique because uh, you don't have to do too much of manipulation like uh, what has been described especially like puncture access capsulo uh, laser capsulotomy because you have to use uh, Uh, a difficult procedure because here you need a just a simple needle and uh, which is similar to the sewing needle it has to be a very sharp needle you need to just puncture the entire capsule and uh, it gives a micro capsulotomy kind of uh, formation in the capsule which has a strength uh, and resistance against the pressure which is there in the interventricular space uh, the simplicity and its effectiveness is important now as you have asked what happens if you have a if you don't have a fluid in the interventricular space it's just a fluffy cortical material dr dhami has very nicely uh, published one uh, paper recently because the use of the anterior segment oct where you could find out the fluid pockets in the interventricular space whether the fluid pockets are one or multiple fluid pockets or no fluid pockets also so you can do anterior segment ocd to know that whether really the fluid is there or it's just the fluffy the swollen cortical material if you have a swollen cortical material then of course because uh, this technique may not work and uh, you have to opt for the the other techniques like where we do as do a single stage uh, the spiraling technique or very micro capsular axis we do at the center and then try to evacuate the 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 uh, this fluffy material out of the capsular bag and uh, you can carry on with the completed axis later on at the this stage also but here in this particular technique if you find most of the uh, cases uh, you have the fluid pockets and uh, the fluid pockets like what happens even a single puncture if you are able to evacuate two to three drops or even the two drops of the liquid out of the capsular bag the the capsule becomes relaxed because it, the decompression happens even with the two, two drops of the fluid coming out and uh, the fluid pockets in a in a solen lens especially in the intermissile cataract you have a two pockets you have anterior pocket and then the posterior to the nucleus which is between the nucleus and the posterior capsule and generally these cases have a form cortical material at the equator so which separates the two these two pockets but as i said because if you are able to evacuate the anterior pocket your capsular decompression happens and you can very simply carry on the capsular axis but in some cases like if uh, the fluid is more in the posterior pocket then you just do few punctures and uh, try to press the nucleus posteriorly many times when you press the nucleus posteriorly the posterior fluid would start coming out into the anterior anterior segment anterior uh, pocket and then you can evacuate it and the very uh, doctor uh, from the yeah. singapore was very nicely seen about the use of the milking technique where you can use a air cannula or you can use a visco cannula go to the periphery press the nucleus and milk it out you can milk out the fluid from the the capsulotomy which we have made at the center uh this technique actually uh, is a very simple technique and it works very well 
and uh, you just need a very simple needle and uh, just puncture the capsule and uh, uh, you can uh, generally one uh, puncture is enough but sometimes if you see the multiple pockets then you can do multiple punctures but it has these punctures has to be within the 5 mm of the the radius of the center uh, nucleus and uh, so that you can uh, create a capsular axis of 5 5.5 mm or 6 mm sir we can have comments from dr jivan titial titial sir can you comment on this technique you are another master in the uh, phaco emulsification and in pediatric cataracts titial uh, th thank you thank you prashant uh, uh, dr ranj prasad shown a wonderful technique uh, in a wide cataracts it does work out if you do a small opening in the anterior capsule in, in difficult cases like this as uh, many people would have seen my presentations also earlier we have described the the spectrum of uh, white cataracts uh, with uh, uh, introp OCT or ASOCT in these cases, and we have classified them accordingly. So if you know what type of white cataract you are facing, then you can uh, plan your uh, uh, surgical steps for a capsulotomy or capsular axis accordingly. As uh, rightly described by Dr. Ajinda Prasa, it is those cases where you have uh, pockets which are uh, underneath the uh, hydrated cortical fibers which doesn't get released even after you make an opening in the anterior capsule and internal anticular pressure still remains even after opening the capsule in these cases. These are cases you have a very high chance of peripheral extension. But in those cases where you have a totally fluid filled cartilage, which uh, you have a... what uh, Dr. R.P. was talking about, those are cases as soon as you make a puncture, either the fluid will leak out uh, with a significant flow or uh, you have a very little fluid. So those cases, you have a chance of extension. I rightly pointed out the major teaching for these cases are to maintain the anterior chamber pressure uniformly during your capsular access procedure. And that can only happen if your viscoelastic doesn't leak out. And you maintain the pressure on the anterior capsule from the center to periphery. So what now did I talk about to my student to maintain a viscoelastic which remains in the anterior chamber? So first you have to put a dispersive viscoelastic, then over that you have to put a coercive viscoelastic. So what coercive viscoelastic will maintain the chamber? A dispersive will never leak out when you try to uh, uh, draw the fluid in these cases. Because what happens if you have milky fluid, you tend to press your wound area to take out the milky fluid out. In that process, your capsular pressure changes. And that is the time the extension can happen in these cases. So if you use a combination of viscoelastic, which is a new uh, concept in all these difficult scenarios, you can maintain the pressure in the periphery also, especially when you feel your peripheral area, because they, once you make a central opening, the lens uh, nucleus you know, bulges upwards. And there's a more pressure towards the mid periphery or peripheral area. So that is where you require a pressurized uh, dispersive viscoelastic. But I think if you make a small opening, if you have a raised lenticular pressure, you can aspirate by a needle, you can aspirate by a bimanual cannula, then see how uh, effectively you are decreasing the pressure, then you can do our access very, very comfortably. So most of the time, it has to be a two-stage uh, capsular access in these cases uh, of intubescent white cataracts. Okay. Meanwhile, we continue with the discussion. Bibhuti and Divakan, can you declare the section four or five winners so that they can join us on the Zoom platform as well as the runner on your chat box? Sure, sir. Dr. Bibhuti will be declaring the four or five segment winners. Please. Yes, sir. So the winner of section four is Dr. Kabita from New Delhi. Congratulations, Dr. Kabita. And the winner for section five is someone for a change who is not from Delhi and who is not from RP Center. Uh, she is uh, Dr. Zeba Sheikh from Pondicherry, Section 5. Congratulations, Dr. Zeba and Dr. Kabita. Uh, both the winners uh, and all the all the section winners will be getting a link on the registered mobile number and we request them to join in the Zoom meeting to have an interaction with our experts and to get felicitated. Uh, over to you, Prashant sir and Devakan sir. Devakan sir. So let's declare the runner up for today's uh, session. So it's Dr. Shainaz Anzum from Hyderabad. Congratulations, Dr. Shainaz. And the 
Winner for today's session is Dr. Vishal Thakkar from Ahmedabad. So, congratulations. I hope everybody can join soon so that we can start. So meanwhile, we can continue with our discussion and uh, one last technical question. After that, we can have some non-ophthalmic chat with the guests who, who are with us. So over to you, Bebuti and uh, uh, Divakan. Yeah, uh, sir, I am done with the question, my, with my, my set, of, set of questions with Dr. Rajendra Prasad, sir. Uh, I think it's an excellent innovation. And uh, Devakan, sir, if you can. Let, let me put uh, one thing there. I think, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think what Rajendra Prasad did mention, if you use a femtosecond laser devices uh, in these uh, white cataracts, it can uh, always ease out your chances of having an Argentinian flag. Till date, there has been no description of an Argentinian flag with a femtosecond laser capsulotomy. Because you do have uh, micro additions remaining in these cases, but you can still complete those rexes because by the time you open the chamber, the pressure has gone. So femtosecond laser is a definite safety in cases with uh, intumescent white cataracts. So, but for underprivileged surgeons like us, we would look, then, at, look up at uh, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, sir. Yeah, that is true, that is true. But uh, this is a forum for a young people okay. and young people have to adapt to a newer things because I, I, I am fully convinced the future is all technology. Okay. And uh, today uh, we are off microscope. Tomorrow you'll be sitting in your office and doing the surgeries also. Yes, robotics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if the okay. sir is underprivileged, then I don't know in which category. To be. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> okay. So uh, now it's time for Beyond Ophthalmology. We have privileged guests with us, Dr. Tityal sir and Dr. Rajendra Prasad sir. So this is something a chat beyond ophthalmology. So uh, first, so to, is, to be to be, to be you know uh, in such a wonderful year 2021, both Rajendra Prasad and I am, I am from the same uh, state. You know we belong to the same place. Sir, I, I want to <laughs> uh, ask you both of you, sir. Also. also. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Titiyal was uh, my, when I was senior resident, he was my junior resident. That, that's correct, that's correct. Sir, what is it that in Himachal, all the people, all the people, the people, all the top most people, you all of the people, all of the people, the rising stars, luminating stars are there. You both. We are from Uttarakhand, not Himachal. Yeah. We both are from Uttarakhand. Sir, it's like this, in the cold area, the man has a little bit more brain. <laughs> PGI Chandigarh ke head bhi dekhiye director saab bhi aap hi ke Himachal ke hum lower lying areas ke logon ko koi aisa thoda sa kam IQ hai kya <laughs> I don't know whatever be it sir uh, how was your journey from uh, I should say from Uttarakhand to Delhi both of you either of you can answer sir and where is your final uh, love for Uttarakhand or stay at Delhi see I I actually uh, belong to a very, very small place in uh, uh, district Uttar Kashi of Uttarakhand that is called as a Harsil. Harsil, you must have heard it, it has become a very uh, important tourist place now at present. And because of many reasons, it's uh, one of the biggest uh, army base uh, of uh, Uttarakhand uh, along the China border. And uh, the place where I live uh, called as a Harsil, which is hardly uh, 60 to 70 kilometers from the China border. So I studied my, did my basic education in that place and uh, where we had to walk almost five kilometers to reach the school every day morning. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a very, very cold place, uh, uh, full of snow. Now in winters, you can't walk even because there's almost eight to 10 feet snow there now at present. And even in summers also, it's very cold. So that was my basic education and, uh, but uh, I had a, zeal to study from the beginning itself. My elder brother was a teacher in a basic school there, a basic school. He, so I was, uh, I used to live with him. And uh, from there, then uh, I did my uh, MBBS uh, from the Chhansi Medical College in UP, uh, through the UP uh, entrance of uh, medical entrance. And then after completing the MBBS from Chhansi, then I took up the examination for the Holiday Institute and uh, I got selected there for the MD. So I did my MD and CNC over there. But I always uh, had a mind uh, not to uh, 
do the government job. I want always wanted to come in private practice, so I uh, took up the private practice. Uh, uh, <laughs> but what you can see, because without any support and uh, with a zero, you can say base in the Delhi, because uh, we don't have uh, any forefathers or something like which you could uh, they could help. Because uh, even I was living in a rented house uh, for a very long time, almost uh, ten years in a rented house. And started a very small clinic with a very uh, small uh, gadgets of ophthalmoscope and tonometer <laughs> like that. So slowly I build up my practice and uh, my center also. Now we have uh, three centers in Delhi, a full three centers, and uh, these centers are fully equipped with all the latest equipments. And we are doing all research work. We have a complete team of uh, 15 to 20 people and uh, uh, doing all sort of surgeries and, uh, and uh, uh, giving uh, the best possible uh, facilities for the patients. And uh, we are doing, uh, over that, we are doing a lot of community services. I go every year to my state and do uh, eye camps, uh, which includes the screening eye camp as well as the surgical eye camp. And I've done in a remote places like uh, uh, called as a Badrinath, you know, the Badrinath Dham. We have, we have did a very big camp there and we operated almost 50 cases there also a few years back. And uh, we keep on doing a lot of community services for our state uh, because that is my heart without uh, my state because I, uh, every moment of my life, I remember the place from where I have come. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's a, such a humble beginning and where you have reached destination, it is for our young viewers who are watching us to ape and follow. Titiyal, sir, over to you there. <laughs> I remember in one of the Uttarakhand meeting, you shared with me that your village is somewhere down there. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and you came up there and from there you have risen up to the ranks of being a Padma Shri, awarded Padma Shri. How do you look at this journey, sir? How tough <laughs> I think, you know, it was, <clears throat> I think uh, some people are born lucky, I think. And I've been one of the luckiest person uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I, I have a similar background as what uh, Dr. Rajinder Prasad talked about. Uh, I really congratulate him uh, doing a wonderful work uh, in his career, building his institution in Delhi and getting his, you know, children into that also and doing wonderful service to our local people. And uh, we are fortunate uh, sitting in Delhi. And uh, it's not only we are serving the people of Delhi, we are serving our people from our uh, community also, Uttarakhand. And biggest service uh, which I have done in my life is, you know, to serve my own people in a difficult situation uh, in Delhi, getting them treated in AIMS. That's one of the biggest thing which I have done for my own people. Secondly, I am very proud that I'm in a you know, place where I started my uh, medical journey. I became a you know, student and postgraduate and uh, became a faculty. And uh, having that opportunity is very, very rare to people to have so many students going through you and they uh, are the, you know, your own uh, vision, your image, they carry forward to various parts of the world. So that's a really, I think, very, very lucky to uh, have uh, you know, a situation like that to somebody. And I'm very fortunate with that. My village is also very, very small. As he said, uh, we used to walk uh, almost two, three days to read a, reach a primary school and then middle school. But fortunately, uh, my father was in Lucknow for some time. So I had to come to Lucknow for my 12th. There I knew that there is an institution called Ames. And luckily, I got into that also. And uh, just the one story how I became an ophthalmologist is a story also. During my internship, I was in a village posting a, a place called Ballabgarh in Haryana, which is Ames uh, peripheral area. Uh, one of my senior, senior resident surgery, uh, he gave me some surgery during my internship. And he told me, you have a very nice hand, why don't you become a surgeon? So I opted for surgery as my first choice for a, a post graduation, But unfortunately, I could not get in a first attempt. And in second attempt also, I had to take a second choice. That was my opth ophthalmology. And that is how I got into ophthalmology. And uh, one of my junior, who is a cardiologist now in Himachal Pradesh, 
he told me i why didn't you join ophthalmology because single handedly you can do everything you can do a medicine medicine practice you can do surgery also you don't require a anesthetist help also and that's a very good branch and uh, you are little you know you're not that person who can go around and uh, put your weight for thing if it's very good for you and i nearly joined a railway service at that time you know uh, so i still give it to my friend colleague and uh, he's in a himachal now who pushed me into this uh, area and um, and appreciate my teachers who re- really at my residency also during my junior residency they used to uh, tell me you have a very good surgical hand and that uh, would you know give you a encouragement to uh, anybody that is ho- how i appreciate my students also i always pick up uh, students uh, uh, good things but appreciate their good attitude good approach to a particular situation clinical case or surgery wise also and uh, working with young people i think that's a possibility many of us don't have because they have a good mind good thinking they know the uh, how to get best out of a situation and that's how we have you know so many publication from rp center so many techniques so many patient we take care of i think uh, uh, prashant you will realize uh, technology uh, comes because it's a demand of not us the demand of uh, the people who are going to go uh, through us with the training for them only we have to work and we have to establish things and ultimately i'm very fortunate that i have so much large number of patient uh, uh, coming to us because if, if they are there we are there so these two people my students and my patient have given me this uh, uh, you can say name which i always indebted to my you know uh, institution my uh, teachers and my students i in fact uh, i would say if they are there i'm there so thank you for you know this platform uh, talking in front of young young people thank you tiyal sir in fact uh, you are such a proud teacher and we have today uh, young tag bibuti as your proud student over here so he was also sharing some good thoughts about you when we started uh, uh, planning for this uh, session for this month uh, january and that's how you are with us sir so uh, guys all the viewers young guys listen it is not that you need a pedestal to become a padma shri or have an institute three institutes in a city like delhi you need to have a zeal you need to have a determination you need to have a focus so please do not use it as an excuse it is the sheer greed of this two people whom you, who are sharing the stage with you that they are at their respective destinations which we all would love to emulate so with this we come to the end of the chat and it is time for us to felicitate our winner sir so uh, sai uh, do we have all the people uh, who are winners today uh, on the uh, platform almost one everybody else is there yeah okay so we start with the felicitation ceremony so the first uh, section one winner uh, please uh, over to uh, divakant you have to announce and dr ptl uh, sir will be interacting and uh, virtually handing over the prize to him yeah So the section one winner is Dr. Sohini Mandal from New Delhi. Yeah, Dr. Sohini, are you there? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Video. Congratulations. And Thank you. Thank and this you. virtual gift voucher by Dr. Titiyal sir and a few questions to her non-optimistic sir. <laughs> Sohini, a uh, wonderful uh, congratulations. I uh, I I SMS you before you had this, you know, fifteen hundred in your hand. and i'm pretty sure you will uh, treat us uh, no tomorrow uh, in the ot uh, uh, let's have a cake from your side yes sir definitely sir <laughs> congratulations it, it, it was a no, dif- difficult section prashant you know looking for a young people asking them a history of cataract and they would have never seen icc in their life also oh. but uh, she mm-hmm. done a good uh, job there congratulations sony wonderful Thank so you need to remember this is from a UC president who represents the younger blood like you okay diva yes. kanthu uh, uh, diva had uh, strategized this particular history so yeah. you can either curse him or you can fat him for whatever it has happened for you okay. <laughs> congratulations once more thank you so much so now the section 2 winner bibuti declare kariye and unko dr uh, Titiyal sir, he felicitate करेंगे. The second uh, winner of section two is उनका आयुषी सिन्हा from Ames, New Delhi. Sir, to please do the honors. क्या 
Yeah, are you see? Are you there? Yes, sir. Uh, again, congratulations, beta, and uh, mm -hmm. very proud that you know you could do a justice to your training in RP Center, and uh, uh, very nice to see you there. And uh, you also have won uh, fifteen hundred rupees. This is nothing, you know. It is the uh, your uh, way of accepting these uh, learning and replicating uh, time and time uh, winning uh, various uh, quiz awards. Uh, that's very nice, and keep it up. And Thank you. Uh, wish you much more uh, laurels in the future. Thank so, you, sir. Ayushi, you are Cornia wale ho ki kya banne wale ho? Abhi kaun si year mein ho? Sir, I, am, I, just, <laughs> hmm? I just completed. I am in sixth semester. I just gave my MD exams. So, what she, she just just cleared the exam. Okay. Good. So, what she'll be looking for? She will be looking for residency, senior residency now. Yes, um, to appear in the exams. Very which you have developed love in last six uh, uh, semesters. I really enjoyed my cornea posting. I really enjoyed my refractive posting. I was posted with Sir also. So I got the opportunity to see him operate as well. So I really liked all that. Uh, I have enjoyed the entire course of RP Center. So retina as well. So I'm kind of confused in what I want the most. <laughs> Let us see. <laughs> देखो प्रोफेसर अतुल कुमार सर भी सुन रहे हैं और इधर जीवन सर भी सुन रहे हैं आप बता दो आपकी चॉइस क्या है उसने दोनों बताए ना इट्स वेरी स्मार्ट थैंक यू कांग्रेचुलेशन आयुषी नाउ लेट्स गो टू द सेक्शन थ्री विनर सो दिवाकांत यू हैव टू डिक्लेयर सेक्शन थ्री विनर इज डॉक्टर प्रेरणा फ्रॉम वर्धा राजेंद्र प्रसाद सर यू आर गोइंग टू वर्चुअली हैंड ओवर द वाउचर एंड फेलिसिटेट हर एंड इंटरेक्ट विथ हर डॉक्टर प्रेरणा आर यू देयर यस सर पुट ऑन योर ऑडियो वीडियो यस आई ऑलरेडी या यस यस डॉक्टर प्रेरणा कांग्रेचुलेशंस थैंक यू सर एंड इट्स वंडरफुल फीलिंग लाइक आई एम रियली थ्रिल्ड फॉर यू आह विनिंग दिस काइंड ऑफ प्लेटफॉर्म बिकॉज दिस गिव्स यू गिव्स How how spirited you are actually. So this is uh, something like uh, one uh, student at this age or, or of uh, the ophthalmologist of your age should uh, be into. So it's a wonderful feeling and uh, congratulations to you. And Thank this you. Gift of fifteen uh, hundred, uh, Doctor Prashant is, has given to you and uh, uh, will be handed over to you later on. Okay. Yeah. So wonderful. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Now, section four. Uh, the winner of section four is Dr. Kavita Tiwari from New Delhi, Ames, New Delhi. Uh, sir, to please do the honors. Is she there, Kavita? You are there. Yes, yes, sir. I am here. Ah, uh, Kavita, again, congratulations, uh, uh, winning this. Thank uh, you, sir. Uh, what, uh, how how do you feel winning a uh, quiz like this? Obviously, it feels very good. <laughs> that's very nice and uh, keep it up and uh, keep working and uh, next time win the you know uh, the top prize thank you sir definitely sir good good okay thank you sir yeah i'm sorry here yeah. please go ahead yeah and uh, the winner for section 5 is dr zeba sheik from pondicherry congratulations dr zeba uh, rajendra prasad sir to please do the honors Hello, Zeba. Hello, sir. Uh, first of all, congratulations to you for uh, winning this uh, uh, session of uh, the brain teasers, and which is, I think, uh, is getting very popular amongst the young students and uh, the people like you are coming up, uh, uh, participating in this platform and winning this is a great feeling, and uh, it's really congratulations to you. And Thank you. You are exactly from which place? You said. Sir, uh, I'm studying uh, in Pondicherry, sir. So you are in Pondicherry, okay? That's great. Yes, sir. Thank you. Is she the Tiwari? Tiwari from which which place? Bihar. Sorry. So you belong to which state? Sir, I belong to Ahmedabad basically, but I'm Achha. studying. I'm pursuing my uh, MD uh, MS from uh, uh, Pondicherry. Zipper? No, sir. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, sir. Mahatma Gandhi. Okay. 
keep it up thank keep you so congratulations dr zeba and now over to section winners Se- sorry. section win- session sorry, winners session winners sare ladkiyan jeete hue kya baat hai ha ah, sir they are, they are super super intelligent <laughs> see we all are uh, on the podium we are all males we need to really ponder <laughs> what we should be doing <laughs> thank you for the last <laughs> so the runner up we have dr shainaz anjum from hyderabad uh, rajin prasad sir to do the honors please hello shainaz uh, are sir. you there yes sir i am here sir let's see your video okay congratulations and uh, for winning uh, this uh, uh, session of uh, brain teasers thank and, you sir. Uh, you are runner up and uh, it's a great feeling for you yes sir uh, really congratulations and uh, please keep it up and uh, uh, next you. time you should uh, come up on the top yes sir i am also from rp center sir and i have also learned from titial sir and all <laughs> other <laughs> so, very nice very nice yes sir when did you pass out from the rp center so last year sir last year and now where you are settled so i am in hyderabad right now so i haven't joined any fellowship so i am just looking for yes, okay you be joining the fellowship yes. that's good sena you have been wonderful during uh, your stay in rp center i still remember you thank you so much sir it's an <laughs> so honor for me sir shana <laughs> jeter congratulations seriously it's a clean sweep for our rpc this time i probably this uh, I, our invited guest uh, least has provoked uh, or rather invoked all the people to be participating all rpc alumni only participating congratulations once more and keep we it up we are really, really proud of uh, rp center and because uh, the students coming up under dr tidhia i am really proud of because uh, being from rp center and it, it, it gives a great feeling that uh, our students are winning everything congratulations, congratulations. thank you sir thank so you sir the final okay. prize today yes go ahead So the big winner for today is Dr. Vishal Thakkar from Ahmedabad. Vishal, are you there? Yes, sir. I am here. Just put on your video on. Uh, it's already on, sir. Yeah, great. So, take it out. Hello, Vishal. Hello, sir. Uh, how are you today? Sir, I'm very good, sir. <laughs> so, Vishal, what's your? Not any, eh? No, no, he's. No, sir. I'm not from RP Center. Actually, I wanted to. I still want to pursue senior residency from RP Center. I already wrote the last exam. I'm also writing uh, exam this time. Okay, Unfortunately, okay. Unfortunately, I couldn't get last time. I got only one less mark uh, from the cutoff. Oh, 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 oh. So, <laughs> so no, we wish you wish you all the best, and uh, uh, may God help you this time to get into RP Center. thank you sir and uh, vishal what's your feeling uh, winning a uh, you know uh, the coveted uh, first prize so it's really wonderful it's uh, amazing opportunity to hear to such uh, stalwarts like you sir we have learned so much from you watching your videos and uh, reading your publications in jcrs and i really want to pursue uh, cornea and uh, cataract uh, training uh, in rp center if so your uh, your uh, basic education uh, medical uh, from which place sir uh, i am from ahmedabad and uh, okay. ug and pg i have done from uh, municipal medical college at ahmedabad okay okay you to your pure ahmedabadi hai yes sir <laughs> to something you say in a gujarati to us um you are happy you can say that uh, ke kem che bahut majja va sir the wish vishal as uh, you know uh, i uh, strongly feel you know uh, my own uh, you know entire teaching uh, career of now extending more than 30 years i always think that uh, the younger people should come up with a better ideas and those ideas will take us to uh, you know we and the entire society will take us to a brighter future a brighter future for us is a brighter vision and the vision will come from a better corrections and that can only possible if you have a knowledge and you translate your knowledge to a the skill which uh, ultimately translate to a patient's care so again wish you all the best vishal hope thank to you. see you in rp center thank you sir vishal congratulations once more par agar aap bol dete ki retina dekho bhai do co-host bhi retina wale hai मेन होस्ट इज ऑल्सो रेटिना अगर बोल देते रेटिना वाले हैं तो मैं पतियाल सर को थोड़ा सा पूछ लगा देता आपके बिया पर आपने बोल के हमें नाराज कर दिया 
by the way congratulations <laughs> keep it up you should do you know whatever your passion love uh, you have for and we wish you all the best so we come to the conclusion of today's uh, event that is a, uh, episode 8 i'm really thankful to all the participants who participated in a big number all can congratulate all the section as well as session winners and my special gratitude to the invitees invited guest who could spare time that is dr rajendra prasad sir dr titiyal sir dr harsha bhattachar ji sir for sparing time for our small event that is brain teasers in fact this brain teasers we invite you guest like you because you are the people who the younger generation looks up at and you have been an inspiration to even our generation so sir keep inspiring us and we would definitely love to see you more so on our platforms to keep inspiring our younger new generations definitely prashant and uh, don't say it's a small you have uh, made it a big uh, you know program i have been uh, seeing your programs listening to uh, your quizzes my students are winning uh, also in a, in a previous uh, episodes also and uh, uh, two people two young people both uh, devakant and uh, my own uh, student uh, kashyap they they were very nice you can say uh, the way they put up questions and uh, it is like you uh, know our uh, case presentation what we do first mm-hmm. you have a case then explain then discuss very nicely done and that is what i think quiz should be ultimately the basic uh, part the basis of generation of that question and the uh, basis of answering that question correctly should also be told to young generation and your people are done uh, the young people are done wonderful uh, job yes, congratulations sir, and see you again yes sir i am only a catalyst in fact uh, basically it is this two young turks who did the job they did the questions we in, uh, provoked them to do all those things and they do really do hard work along with my colleague dr shilpi who yeah was, shilpi also yeah, yeah, she, she done, done all those work. things so we are really thankful diva as well as uh, bibuti for wonderful efforts and it is appreciated by one and all so congratulations and at, uh, also i would like to thank entod for this uh, opportunity for sponsoring us with all the prizes and for this uh, financial support for keeping our brain teasers live thank you and to the back end office sai and his numerotech team once more thank you and we are ha- meeting again on 7th of february for our next episode that is episode number 9 on 7th of february at the same time so till then bye bye and wish you all a happy new year and a spirited new year thank you thank you sir thank you thank bye. you thank you shan and uh, congratulations to you for bringing up this uh, beautiful platform for the young students you, and uh, i think this uh, program has become talk of the town that's so thank you uh, appreciable and uh, vibhuti and uh, divakar divakant you both have done excellent and wonderful work today and uh, i've seen your capability and uh, it's really appreciable thank you thank you, thank you very Isn't much uh, divakant has that lucknowi touch you know the way he speaks very you know uh, oh. uh, typical you know the bowler, nice way yes, ha ji uh, that mm-hmm. i like it uh, very nice and right. vibhuti has typical that you know ranchi uh, style <laughs> yeah. both of them are different style <laughs> very 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 nice uh, thank you sir lucknow is my second home uh, devakant uh, so where did you study so you, you mentioned you did you uh, i was yeah. in a, a small place called uh, national college okay. yes. which is uh, you know hazrat ganj i did my 12th from there then mm-hmm. i did a one year coaching in a in amidabad you know krishna coaching at that time it was one of the famous coaching center of up those days medical coaching yes i yes. still remember my uh, ge- geology and botany and physics teachers because of them only i could get into aims you know otherwise as you know uh, dr rajendra prasad would know we used to write in hindi and speak hindi only Yeah. and I, i i didn't know how to write in english the entire biology physics uh, and chemistry really and nice. the aims exam was you know uh, those days was a uh, theory exam you have to write in a uh, you know english yeah. and because of that one year coaching i could do everything yeah. so that's a wonderful uh, platform dr titian had at least uh, some opportunity because his father was in a in a very yeah. good job and he had a, uh, a access to uh, lucknow and all because i never had anything my father was a very small scale farmer a uh, very small scale farmer he, he was not working government job uh, so i'll just tell you